Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in uh, John Harper Publishing's uh, EU Public Affairs Insider webinar series. Uh, this one is on delegated and implementing acts. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. As you may notice, we are recording this webinar. This will be um, in order to uh, be able to put it onto the John Harper Publishing website. So if you have colleagues who've not been able to attend today, then you can certainly direct them towards the John Harper Publishing website and they'll be able to watch the um, webinar at a later date. Um, we will also be doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so we'll have um, a short introduction by John Harper from John Harper Publishing, and then we'll be handing over to Sabina and Aaron, um, and at the end we'll be having a Q&A. If you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat, and I will try and pick them up. Um, and if you could direct your questions to one of the two presenters, then we know who can answer. But both of them may wish to answer questions as well if they are pertinent. Um, one thing to note, the chat doesn't show up on the video recording. So I will be sort of repeating the question so that people who are watching the, the, the video to a later date will know what the question is. So if you have any questions throughout, just pop them in, in the chat. Um, with that in mind, I'd like to hand over to John Harper from John Harper Publishing, um, who will be introducing today's uh, webinar, which features the work in the two books, How to Work with the EU Institutions and How the EU Institutions Work, also known as the Orange and Purple or Violet book. So over to John Harper Publishing. Uh, John Harper, sorry. Thank you very much, Nick. And um, before we move on to the, to the event proper, um, it's my privilege to introduce uh, today's speakers. Um, we have, um, first of all, Sabina Langer, who is a senior lecturer at the European Institute of Public Administration, APA in Maastricht, um, which of course is uh, renowned for the training it provides for both EU and national ser civil service officials. Uh, Sabina says she first got involved in the world of delegated and implementing acts almost a decade ago, preparing officials to take on the rotating council presidency. And since then, she has trained, taught, researched and published on the subject. And among those publications, Sabina worked on the chapter on delegated and implementing acts in the Orange Book, this one, this one here. Um, our other speaker today is Aaron McLaughlin. Um, who's been both a lobbyist and campaigner in Brussels for some 20 years. Aaron's currently a senior advisor at Fleischmann Hillard and in the past his roles have included being head of public affairs at the European Chemical Industry Council and head of WWF's European Marine Program. On the other side of the table as it were, Aaron has worked in DG Environment and for two British MEPs on environmental legislation. And for the past decade, most of his client work has in fact been in the area of delegated or implementing acts. So after that short introduction over to the main event, just with a reminder that if you can't stay for the whole thing or have colleagues who miss it, as Nick mentioned, the event is being recorded and will be available in a day or two, give it 36, 48 hours on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to John for that introduction and I'll hand over to our two speakers who will take you through this very interesting and relevant topic. Thank you very much Nick, thank you John for organising this series of seminars and Nick for guiding us through. Um, I have to thank also Alan Hardiker and Michael Keating who not only authored the, this chapter in the two previous editions of uh, this book series, but who also, by the virtue of leaving APA a long time ago, handed over to me the field of Delegated and Implementing Act. So my special thanks goes to them because otherwise I would not have be part of this uh, extremely passionate family. So uh, if uh, Nick, we can move to my first slide. I will just use a couple of slides and we will exchange between myself and Aaron um, to 
present something that is probably obvious to most of you, but some of you might still be struggling. That is why this field is so exciting. I mean, most of you tuning in today will know that, but as I said, I have known people who have struggled to get passionate about what we used to call comitology. So I will use this scheme here to not talk about the hierarchy of acts, but to point to the uh, main relations of accountability and control, as I believe they are the two um, that make this field not only exciting institutionally, but also important. Uh, and Aaron will complement me on that within minutes. So a bit of a vocabulary. So I think within the last few years, we have moved on from comitology. Um, I have this privilege of um, being regularly with officials in different institutions, in agencies, and working in the member states. And I have to say that slowly but surely, with more resistance in one than the other institutions, the word comitology has faded away. Uh, so we are in the world of delegated and implementing uh, acts. And in this world now, the old comitology split, and it's split in uh, two significant ways. It's split in recognizing that there is a, a difference between the acts that were previously adopted only by, let's say, one set of procedures and with one set of accountability. Um, and then, of course, this brought with it also the split in now procedures. So what we see here on the slide is that, first of all, delegating implementing acts are formally called non-legislative acts. But many of you will operate with secondary legislation, and there's nothing wrong with that. But just formally, these are non-legislative acts in EU jargon, because the treaty simply doesn't apply legislative procedures to them, which uh, give grants to legislative acts, as you can see in the, uh, in the ping, pong, ping pong. So formally non-legislative acts. And then we have this distinction, whereas the delegated acts can be adopted only on the basis of legislative acts, meaning they can only come from one of the legislative procedures, and it is the commission that adopts them. So there will be a so-called basic act, another element of vocabulary here, adopted by either co-decision slash OLP or special legislative procedures that will ask the commission to further flesh out or to undertake further action, meaning the legislative act and legislators there will delegate to the commission to adopt further acts, which is why these are delegated acts. On the other hand, you can see that in implementing, there's also a grammatical distinction here, implementing acts, which are the descendants of the old comitology, can be a adopted on the basis of legally on the sorry on the basis of legally binding acts and this is a broader term and that refers to the uh, to the right side of the slide meaning there are other acts that can be adopted directly based on the treaties and are not legislative so implementing acts can be adopted on the basis of legally binding acts they can be adopted by the council as well we'll put this on the side but by the commission primarily and in implementing acts the commission simply implements policies and it does that not on behalf of the legislator because the legislator doesn't implement but it does that on behalf of the member states there's a clear connection in article 291 where first paragraph clearly says it's the member states that implement in principles but when uniform conditions for implementations are needed it's when we ask the commission to do it and the question of accountability here is, of course, not to the legislator, but to the member states, meaning the control here is exercised by the member states, whereas in the delegated acts, the control is exercised by the legislator. And this is the novelty that was brought about by the Lisbon Treaty 10 plus years on. I think it's getting excited, not that much anymore at the stage of legislation and adoption of legislation, but mostly and as Aaron will point out and, and show you at the stage of the actual adoption uh, of this act. Now, I might have shown more why this is exciting internally, interinstitutionally, but I think Aaron can uh, show you a lot more how why this really, really, truly matters for, for all of us. Aaron, over to you. And next slide. Hi. Um, so I I took a um, 
something from the book just to show how much legislation laws that the EU pass each year are in fact um, delegated or implementing acts. There's still, in my own field, in particular chemicals, still a lot of RPS measures, which are being slowly but surely uh, eradicated. So what always struck me when I moved to um, sunny Brussels back in uh, September 1996, um, perhaps before many people on the call were born, but um, was everyone, and even to this day, obsessed about ordinary legislation. And having worked on the passage of the first clean air legislation, what really struck me, I was working for a British Labour MEP at the time, and I went into work in uh, DG Environment on the implementation of that legislation, was that the nitty gritty, the implementation of legislation was this technical rulemaking. And it has really important uh, impacts. In chemical um, chemicals where I've spent a lot of my time, it's the, um, the vast majority, and it decides whether your product is banned or not. So it does mean a lot, um, but there's not, historically there's been far less interest in it than I would have envisaged. I think practically for the commission, it has been the source of considerable political headaches. Um, I saw the political um, instructions uh, for the unit dealing with uh, eco-design, which had caused uh, President Juncker's huge annoyance to find out that Europe was in fact uh, regulating the power of vacuum cleaners. Um, and uh, I still get the impression that particular unit still um, has never bothered to read those guidelines issued by the uh, then um, head of cabinet of the president. So um, it is also commercially important. It is also politically important. Uh, a former member state of the European Union, the United Kingdom, of which I hold one passport uh, and, uh, and another from another country. Always the Daily Mail used to seemingly make, uh, have lots of fun stories about uh, Europe doing strange things, most of them about secondary legislation. And what really surprises me and the importance of secondary legislation as compared to ordinary legislation is you have to start very early on. I think if you do not start at the, even when the legislation giving the power of delegation for implementing or uh, delegated acts is being drafted, you're often too late. Um, and I spend a lot of my time trying to help clients or interests responding very quickly when a proposal is pushed through very, very quickly. So it is far quicker than uh, ordinary legislation in the main, although in chemicals, uh, I think one would have to be asleep because most of the work is done by agencies, which is then incorporated um, by delegated or implementing acts. So I think it's um, a busy area, an interesting area, however, a complex area. Um, I should stop speaking, uh, Sabina. Um, I think Aaron made the case, not just in numbers, but in the level of importance for the functioning of the single market uh, and also politically. Um, we will come back to those vacuum clears a bit later on. Um, now, before we open up the discussion, uh, we wanted to give this basics and say why it is exciting, exciting and why it matters, but also, of course, the basics of how things happen these days um, to be able to show what issues still persist. So, um, Nick, if you please show me the next slide. What I'm going to do in very short time is basically run us through the mini policy cycle of an implementing and a delegated act uh, to help, uh, well, to, to set the stage, so to speak, for Aaron then uh, to show you what happens on that blue line that I will not engage with, but it's, it's very important. Um, and, and of course, with all the other stages. So 
Um, what we need first is a basic act that gives rise to or asks the Commission to fulfill certain tasks by adopting now, in this case, an implementing act. And this kind of goes all the way back to the 1960s, the recognition that there are sometimes good reasons for implementation to be done in a uniform way and that the institution that is best placed to do so is the Commission. But of course, provided that there is a proper control exercised over it. So what you have in this stages is of course, the Commission planning, drafting, internally consolidating towards the decision-making. But then before the commission actually adopts a decision, it has to go to the committee composed of member states representatives who then discuss, negotiate, and eventually vote on the commission's draft. And only then, and on the basis of that vote, the commission can proceed to the adoption of the implementing act. Nothing unusual here, the point being that we have an ex ante control by the member states be, who vote on the commission's draft, and then we have the adoption. There are different procedures in place, there were even more in the past, I'm not going to go into details, but that's the basic logic that it's the member states representatives who used to flock down from Schumann to, to Borchette, and now this seems to be working very well online, also because of the limited scope of the actual negotiations. Um, but so it's the member states that I should say, maybe uh, Aaron will contradict me here, work a little bit too close with the commission. Um, there are very rarely sparks here, but those sparks get very public. These would be the likes of glyphosate, for example. They don't necessarily get public because of the member states, but because of, well, people like Aaron and because of a politicization of the issues. Um, you haven't heard me mentioning the parliament. You have on the slide, the blue cloud, which says there is the right of scrutiny of the parliament and council. This is a non-binding right. They can just point to the commission if it exceeded its powers. They don't have a right on saying whether they like or not, or how they would like to change the draft. The commission is not accountable to them in this respect, but of course, as them owning um, the basic act, they can say if the commission exceeded its powers. So this is the implementing act. Now to contrast, my second part is the adoption of delegated acts, Nick, if I may, which is very similar from the commission's point of view. It has to plan, it has to proceed to internal decision-making, it has to decide. But as you can see, the intervention of other actors, of those that control the Commission, is very different here. What you're having now, following the five years of difficult relations and then an agreement in the Interinstitutional Agreement on Better Lawmaking, is an obligatory consultation of experts from all member states and standing invitees from the Parliament and the Council who take part in that uh, consultation, in the expert groups. So we have expert groups. We have other types of consultation, but there are expert groups with member states experts. And there are quite some obligations placed on the commission with regard to that. But after the, the consultation, the commission moves to inter-service consultation, and then it moves to adoption. And it is only after adoption of the act that the council, the parliament, may say yes or no. So the two main differences between the implementing and delegated acts are that here in the delegated acts case, you have an ex post control, so to speak. The act doesn't enter into force until the period for, uh, for objection expires, but it is adopted, meaning it can't be changed anymore. So it's an ex post control and it's only yes or no, take it or leave it. There is no negotiation which means that in order for the council, parliament, and then every other stakeholder to like what it gets on the tables of the council and parliament, the action has to take place before, somewhere around the consultation box on my slide. And this was my introduction for Aaron to explain now how you engage in both cases uh, from, or well, more from outside of the institutions, and then we'll move on to different issues. Super. And next slide, please, Nick. 
So um, here's some general um, guidance, and I've made the um, text so suitably small to force you to uh, purchase uh, the book. Um, so I, I think sort of three practical suggestions. I think it is key that you, you have to know and have a trusted relationship with the small group of officials at the technical and at the cabinet level dealing with your file. Um, in all honesty, it is very difficult to attract cabinet interest in most implementing or delegated acts. It is possible, and there are examples, um, but in the main, it is at the technical ser uh, service level. Um, I think for both, you also need to know the experts and the committee members. Now, there is a challenge, which um, I, um, I disagree with the Commission's current practice. This is, these details are not public. You can hire very expensive consultants uh, and, uh, or rely on uh, friends to pass you it, but those details of um, the officials and the experts who are, in, at the end of the day, acting in a lawmaking capacity are not public. So I think that, make, that makes lobbying and engaging with officials early on very challenging, um, although keeps lots of uh, agencies and law firms very busy, so I shouldn't perhaps criticize it too much. Um, I think thirdly, one of the things which has personally struck me being behind some of the successful challenges is you have to keep your ear to the ground to the exchanges and the expert group, the committees. I think it helps that the parliamentary representatives can attend now uh, to see whether what is being agreed to exceeds the competence uh, that is being uh, given uh, to the commission. So you can bring a challenge. It is very difficult, just a practical element. Pa the parliament, um, and for those of you who cannot sleep, I um, look at most uh, challenges of the Environment Committee who are the most active committee using their power of scrutiny, um, blog on it quite, quite frequently. It takes around a week to draft a good challenge. It takes about two weeks from being notified, um, getting the issue tabled in the committee, voted in the committee, voted in the plenary. So it's a considerable amount of work to bring a challenge and it is not done lightheartedly, whatever people may think. So you need to know from the very start who the key officials in the commission are, um, who the representatives are in the expert committee, uh, the experts and um, the committee members. You need to know in advance the likely MEPs who would be interested in bringing a challenge. Uh, you need to know the group advisors who would be prepared to champion your file. And it is very, you don't have a huge amount of time. I usually say between uh, around two weeks. I'll give you a very practical example. Um, so there is a delegated act put out for public consultation on taxonomy um, in the last month of um, December last year. Hidden on pages 211 and 215 were two, uh, were, were two substance bans. Um, which fortunately um, uh, someone discovered. Um, speaking to the officials in the commission who uh, prepared the file, they had no idea of their existence or where they came from. Um, now, so you have four weeks, you saw the public consultation um, period, which to wade through several hundred pe uh, pages of um, slightly turgid English text, to see if you are about to be banned or not and remind the commission that there's a separate ongoing process um, to deal with that issue. So you have to ch turn things around very, very quickly um, and you have to have a network established beforehand to address an issue. 
So it can be done. Um, it's just a lot of resources have to be brought to play very quickly. And I've done this for, you know, sinners and saints. I have no objection. Um, uh, but it's just a lot of time and a lot of effort in a very short period of time. Sabina. So I think Aaron already hinted, and uh, it's only natural that we continue with some of the issues that will, I believe, also lead to more uh, discussion. Now, I also started with the fact that there was a tension between the institutions. I think I could use a different tense. There are still uh, tensions, but there were five or six of them were addressed then in the Interinstitutional Agreement on Better Lawmaking. So there's consolidation of our shared understanding of the changes that the Lisbon Treaty uh, brought about. And in this context, um, it seemed like the biggest issue uh, between the three institutions is how do we really differentiate or in that language delineate between what is now a delegated and what is an implementing act? We only had one type of act before. And after decades of European Parliament trying to get into the governance, trying to get into those committees and being told repeatedly that you are not an implementer, you are not a member state, we're not doing this instead of you. The, the Parliament, let's say, warned that by showing that this is all fine, that I'm not an implementer, but you're not implementing here either. What you're doing here is also the type of acts that are of different nature. But where exactly do we delineate this? There were a few challenges, uh, but mostly what it was, was tensions that prolonged the decision-making of legislative acts. Um, there would be anecdotes around Brussels already, how all the implementing and delegated acts would be cramped into the last trilogues, how you know this would be then, uh, well, different tactics around the table, let's say, and then also different solutions. Uh, eventually, not in the interinstitutional agreement, but a commitment for after last summer, uh, no, was it now? By now, already 2019, I believe. Uh, the non binding criteria were agreed. It's a five pager, uh, which eventually, and this is also good, I think, cons um, wrote down what was already the consolidated practice. So, what seemed to be the biggest issue and was then written down. By the time it was written down, by the time it was possible to do it, I think it was no longer a biggest issue because tactically, strategically, ways around were found. Uh, institutions are pragmatic to an extent. <laughs> so there are still some open issues here, like you might be noticing then with regard to the MFF files, uh, but also in some places where it's just a no-go and you do have some member states that, well, will not change their opinion and no type of quality drafting will make them change the opinion. I'm not talking about bullying somebody to change the opinion, I'm talking about really actively trying to make uh, the distinction uh, clear. Uh, so what was supposed to be the biggest issue, the criteria, no longer, I believe, is no longer the biggest issue. And I here agree with Aaron that it's the next two issues that are becoming extremely uh, important. Next slide, please, Nick. So, but, uh, unfortunately, we could not in the book um, add in this slide, which I think is, just one second, the computer's doing something strange, is uh, I think the commission over a period of time has become far more open in um, it's handling of delegated and implementing acts. And I think this is, I really commend the uh, literally handful of officials who have been behind this. Um, and I welcomed um, President von der Leyen's commitment to make uh, lawmaking even more transparent going forward. Um, however, there is a big however. Um, I think often you will find that the, um, when your file appears on this register, it is probably too late. Many of the key decisions have already been taken. Um, so I think you need, um, to repeat what I said before, a excellent and good network within the commission 
within the member states, um, their experts and the parliament very early on to know where your file is, where that piece of implementing legislation is, because you may be very disappointed if you just rely on this excellent database. Um, I think one of the great gaps in how secondary lawmaking is undertaken is, and I do not say this lightly, and I'm simply plagiarizing uh, the opinions of the Ombudsman on, on this, is that it is done in secret. Um, you have no idea how member states voted. You have no idea um, who they are because they are acting in a legislative capacity. They're not just turning up to a meeting to discuss guidance documents. Um, and the Ombudsman has found uh, before and is likely in the next few weeks to find again that the commission is uh, um, a finding of maladministration against the commission for keeping this process in essence secret. Now there is a reason for this. This is because the mem uh, speaking to the member state officials who negotiated the first set of rules, they want the process secret because on difficult issues such as pesticides and GMOs, they don't want to let their electorate know how they voted. So they love to pass the buck to the commission. Um, so I, I think that is a weakness of the secondary lawmaking procedure as compared to ordinary lawmaking, where you get to see how your government's voted or how your MEPs vote, voted. Secret law um, voting has been banned in lawmaking uh, legisla legislations, uh, legislatures but, uh, for some time. Um, the uh, current practice reminds me more of the old Soviet Politburo in the 80s. But, um, so I think the key moment, this all lends itself, is the power sits in the hands of the commission. You need to persuade them to support your view. Um, if you do not, and get, um, it is very difficult, if not nearly theoretical, to get what you want. Uh, next slide, Nick. Nick? Ah, oh, super, sorry. Um, the one of the uh, as general questions I receive is, can we stop this delegated or implementing act? Um, and can we get an imp uh, impact assessment? So it is possible, but your chances of securing an impact assessment are difficult. My usual answer is how many billions of euros are at stake? It has to be a significant amount of money or it addresses a deeply sensitive political matter for the commission. 20 million impact for uh, someone isn't going to uh, you know, cut it. So it has to be a significant economic or politically sensitive um, decision. That is what is written in the Commission's own guidelines, if you want to read them. Um, so that is the threshold. And you see how rarely delegated or implementing acts benefit from uh, an impact assessment. It is possible. Um, as to the prospect of challenging, now I've, I, I've discussed this with, and I think we should all acknowledge the great you know, sort of founding father of uh, uh, secondary legislation, uh, Daniel Gagan, um, and we discuss, you know, what is the success rate of challenges? And my sort of back of an envelope calculation is around 2%. That's the, the old RPS measures and the delegated acts, implementing acts, the commission seem just to ignore what the, uh, the parliament do does. And I don't think the council has ever challenged it implementing act, but Sabina, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so it is possible, but the, uh, the, the thresholds in the parliament and the council for challenging 
up very, very high. Um, there was a recent case where um, the commissions wanted to blacklist a number of uh, countries for um, harboring finance, um, financing of terrorism. That was defeated mysteriously by every country. Um, but that was after some, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, some quite brutal lobbying by one or two of the countries on the list. So it is possible, but it is a very high threshold, um, um, which means it's very difficult to engineer. Um, I can answer questions about how one can, but um, the I think one of the challenges of the whole process is that it is too often the commission the parliament and the council, when they are negotiating a piece of legislation, like to kick the um, can down the road and voice difficult political issues onto secondary legislation. Um, I think that is regrettable, but it does, it seems to be happening more and more uh, of, uh, more often. I don't think it's a good way of making laws. I think it's up for, uh, you know, the parliament and council to make difficult political decisions, but that's a separate issue. Sabina, I think that's a nice entry for the final slide. Yeah, indeed. I promised you we're going to get back to those uh, vacuum cleaners. Um, so even though it seemed like the biggest issue is the criteria to delineate between the two, um, as Aaron just showed, is, is the question whether maybe some of the things that are being adopted now with a secondary legislation might not actually deserve the attention of the legislators. Now the treaty itself clearly says that the essential elements of an area shall be reserved for the legislative act and accordingly shall not be the subject of a delegation of power. That is of course in reference to the delegated acts, implementing acts should not touch on the basic act in any case. Now, what we're having is, of course, uh, complexity in the fields. We're having politicization of different uh, areas, but this was not expected to be an issue. We also have case law coming from the 1980s, uh, clarifying what can be subject of comitology and what not. Um, so this is a bit of an unexpected issue now because it's also counterintuitive. No legislator willingly gives power away. So it's, it uh, shows an interesting dynamics here between what is technical and what is political and what different actors understand in this respect. And of course, it brings in the difficulties coming from the complexity uh, of decision-making. And I believe Aaron has a, a good example on that. Which example am I talking about? Well, I, I think taxonomy is a great, great example where I think you have a piece of legislation which sets um, clear, you know, clear objectives. But then I, I think is, and I think it is timely because the commission has just withdrawn the uh, delegated act today um, after, you know, not only, you know, hidden the, on page 211 and 215 of uh, the annex is a proposal to ban something which is already being restricted uh, through the reach process but goes very deeply into the economic and policy choices of governments um, and industry in the member states and i think the commission as the commission new commissioner acknowledged today that maybe maybe the uh, expert group of, and the member states and the uh, commission went a little too enthusiastic uh, in the detailing of how the economic order of Europe would be uh, working. Um, so I think there is not not, a, not only the um, emotional or the exciting issues for uh, President Juncker of why are we regulating um, uh, vacuum cleaners? He had no idea and he was very annoyed when he found out that they were regulating vacuum cleaners and their power. Um, so there's a lot of important issues, which I think the Parliament and the Council too often find easier to kick over to committees to make the decision later on. 
Unfortunately, the case law was altered to allow the commit, uh, allow legislation to be far more flexible. Um, I don't think it was a wise decision, but um, but I will stop there. I think there are some questions. Over to you, Nick. As a, a terribly sorry about that, as, as seems to be the day now with Zoom meetings, I couldn't find my unmute button, even though I seem to be on Zoom more often than anything. So thank you very much to Sabina and Aaron for their presentation. I hope everyone um, has enjoyed it. We'll now hand over for some um, Q&A. So if you do have any more questions, do pop them in the chat. Uh, the first question is from Pauline Lucas. Um, firstly, thank you for the new update of the two books. Um, thank you to John and the entire team for putting that together. Um, the question to Sabina is, what can the impact of the four-week public consultation be on the draft? What's the margin for manoeuvre of the Commission to change the text to take feedback into account? Okay, thank you very much. May I first answer the question that Aaron posed in between and then I'll move on to Pauline. So did the council ever challenge an implementing act? Not since we have a reform of a proper implementing act. So they have a right of scrutiny. They have a right to say, dear commission, you went beyond what we asked you to do. But the logic is also that if there really are issues, they are addressed within the committees. Uh, there, are, there, there is space and this is where member states and the commission uh, work closely um, and the participation and the, the people who participate in an individual committee there tend to be quite stable it differs between one and the other committees but this is these are stable relationships and then if there are issues they're mostly solved there uh, there have been some within the rps area but uh, not in the implementing acts uh, proper and when it comes to delegated acts uh, uh, it is extremely difficult to overturn the commission for the council, which is one of the reasons why the council is not um, that keen on delegated acts, if I can say this euphemistically. Um, as for the questions on the public consultation and feedback, I had these on, on the slide before. Let me just clarify that public consultation is, a, is the normal procedures that comes in the, let's say, the initial stages and the, there we have expert groups and other public consultations. And then, there is the feedback. In legislative acts case, it's after the commission adopts the communication, adopting the legislative proposal. But in delegated acts case, it has to be before the commission's adoption because there has to be a sense into why you're asking for feedback. So what is the margin of maneuver for the commission of this feedback once it already has a draft out? So we're talking about delegated acts here. For implementing acts, let me just say that of course the feedback is also before the commission adopts. Uh, but the margin of maneuver there, as long as it's before the committee is deciding, is of course bigger. So let me start with the implementing acts. There have been cases where on the basis of the feedback, the commission really changed, for example, a transition period. Having heard from people, uh, companies saying this is too short, they would lengthen the transition period. So there is the margin of maneuver there. But uh, then once it comes to the vote in the committee, uh, that is uh, binding unless they have to launch it new. In the delegated acts case, similarly, if there are substantive changes following the last meeting of the expert group with the member states, the commission has to go back um, to that those experts to allow them to express themselves, even if just in writing, not necessarily a meeting is needed, but even in just in writing. So these are now the good practices whereby the commission being accountable to the um, Council and Parliament would go back to that expert group where member states sit and where there are representatives of Parliament and Council with any changes, substantive changes that might happen after. Do they happen? Yes. But Aaron explained how difficult uh, this is. Um, Thank you. Oh, oh. That's from me. Perfect. Thank you, Sabina. Aaron, is there anything you want to add to Sabina's response? No. Perfect. Okay, we'll move on to the, we'll move on to the next question. The question from Niels Lemmers to Aaron: um, Is the current virtual work environment we're in um, taking? Um, is I'll I'll start again. Is the current virtual work environment we are in make taking action on delegated acts and implementing acts more difficult? 
Do you have any examples how to be right on time, challenging, changing the process nowadays? Um, so it's an excellent question. Uh, I actually find access to what is happening a little easier in the, um, the virtual world. Um, so it, maybe it's a little easier. Um, it's easier to get hold of people, have virtual meetings with member states, with um, commission officials. So in many ways, it's easier. Um, I think the major challenge of living on Zoom is sort of cognitive overload um, at the end of a week or a day. Um, but actually, maybe it's a little easier. Um, and that's not to say it's easy. You have, like one of the things which is always personally surprised, uh, or one of the questions I ask in job interviews is, do you like cold calling people? Now, no one really likes cold calling people, uh, but it's a skill you need as a lobbyist to pho phone up total strangers and ask how they can, their view on a file or how they're going to vote. So you, have, you can do a lot more of that and you have to do a lot more of that. So um, actually easier. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Aaron. Um, the next question is for both of you from Alexis Mina. Um, firstly, thank you very much for the webinar on an interesting topic. Thank you, Alexis. Um, what could the real influence an EU agency um, can have on the Commission's Draft Act? The EC can ask for advice, but to what extent is the EC constrained by this advice? Um, also, in your views, when the EC is consulting an EU agency, could it be a game changer for stakeholders? I'll let you choose. Do you want me to take a first stab at that, Sabina? Sorry, go ahead. Okay. So from my experience, um, working in chemicals, where we have a small agency based in honey, sunny Helsinki, is the, the law is very clear. It, the commission is not bound by the uh, opinion of the agency, uh, in particular on scientific advice from the uh, Risk Assessment Committee. In practice, there is a huge degree of deference. Um, I think on all matters, technical and scientific, many commission officials are, are loath to second guess the opinion of an agency, in particular when it comes to does a substance cause a unpleasant health health effect that is very reluctant to second guess. Although the legislation is very clear that they're not bound by it. Um, the better regulation guidelines are very explicit on this. Um, um, I'm not sure many commission officials have ever read the better regulation guidelines, but uh, I, I suggest they do. But it's clear there is discretion, a discretion which is not often used. And the only way you uh, persuade the agencies is by bringing technical and scientific data to the table, uh, preferably objective. So, I can just add that, of course, this is settled in secondary legislation, which uh, usually the one that sets up the agency and its work hmm. um, and the recommendations of the agency, as Aaron just explained, are recommendations of the agency. And you only have, in case of the Frankfurt-based agency, the obligation of the Commission to explain itself if it changes anything. The rest is on, um, as Aaron said, the uh, argumentation. Uh, and there are areas where, I, from my experience, there is a little bit more persuasion that needs to be done from the, uh, from the, from the agencies. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Eric. I, th I think it's Eric Axer, who's one of your co-authors. Um, how would you compare the EU DIA system with the drafting and adopting of sublegal acts in EU member states? We often hear the EU is complex, but how does it compare to its members? And that's for both of you to, to answer. Uh, Eric, I can't answer. I have no idea what happens outside the city. Uh. Well, I've been um, 
privileged again to talk to many member states officials who mostly those who would now suddenly have to deal with delegated and implementing acts, uh, in particular if they are council based and then suddenly this world would enter from the bottom of Rufwasar to the top of Rufwasar because it was subject to legislative negotiations. And there you would have to draw on some reference that would be familiar to them. And you would explain to one country, this is similar than your royal decrees. You would explain to the other ones, these are your government's decrees. Um, there are different uh, types, but what I think is pretty much similar or the same in, in principle to most of them is that the legislators are not involved. Um, now there are, there are slight differences or that's a question of delineation again, but in most cases, when you ask them, would your parliament agree to the format of your, um, uh, uh, of your license for something? Or is that format then done by the government on the basis of the law, which tells you which criteria and which elements need to be in that format or in that form? Um, so I think it is, of course, the EU system is a mixture of all systems, um, but the basic, I think the commonality is that this is a mixture of executive decision-making, and I haven't mentioned that word in my vocabulary explanation. We talk about executive powers here or commission having executive-like powers or commission's delegated powers are executive-like powers. Excellent, thank you very much for that, that answer, Sabina. Um, so the next question is from Jessica to Aaron. Uh, regarding the consultation period, we have seen repeatedly associations, be it trade associations or NGOs, contribute with dozens of versions, even thousands for the taxonomy example, of the same consultation contribution through their members and partners. How effective do you think these strategies are? So my mind has been changed over the last 24 hours. Um, I used to dislike um, mass uh, mailings, whether it's by industry or NGO saying the same thing several thousand times. I, I say that because I used to be one of these officials chairing one of these committees and I just actually found a certain level of, um, you know, pointlessness to say the same thing, you know, many, many times. Usually, although not all the time, with absolutely no technical evidence in the document, um, which I always thought. Now, the classic cases on um, um, uh, mobile phone um, roaming charges where uh, some poor soul in the commission didn't realize that um, Martin Salmeyer was behind the legislation and uh, this unit in the commission was trying to rewrite the legislation and uh, Martin Salmeyer uh, identified several thousand people wrote in going the legislation being uh, uh, changed. So that was the first example where a lot of people wrote in saying, actually, your, uh, your, your implementing rules are actually ignoring the legislation. But I actually found those, those, those submissions quite constructive. Um, so I've actually, you know, and today the, um, you know, the partial withdrawal of the taxonomy uh, draft delegated act is a good example of when maybe it is a good way to indicate to the political hierarchy cabinets and commissioners who do not like seeing their name in the financial times or pravda as i call politica is um it is maybe a useful technique I actually am sad enough to have looked at some of those submissions and I was quite pleasantly surprised. It wasn't, many of them were quite detailed um, and quite, you know, thoughtful. So maybe sort of just emailing, going, I don't like what you're doing because it may hurt me or whatever, isn't that useful. But a few thousand people saying, yeah, you're going to be taking, you know, you know, a little more detail perhaps helps. Does that answer your question, Jessica? Thank you, Aaron. Sabina, is there anything you'd like to add? 
No, um, no not. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm the one who would then go and um, talk to uh, the the officials in all the institutions and in agencies, and then try to explain to the best of my abilities of how to go about their particular ta task in the context of everybody else's task. And of course, here it would also be the question of, you know, what do we do with these thousand submissions? Um, well, you know, the, the better regulation guidelines make it quite clear. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm not surprised that Aaron would say that he changed his mind yesterday <laughs> and it might be changed uh, tomorrow. I think it's really case by case thing. Perfect. Thank you for that. And and Jessica's popped a note in the chat to say yes, thank you. So I think she was happy with the with the answer. Um, we will take one last question before we finish up, and that's a follow up question from Niels for Aaron. Um, so, are you in favour if the response is detailed and stresses an important point? When would you hold on to your former view? So, I think. Um, I think good policy making depends on good evidence being brought to the table, even at a very late stage. So I will admit, I will come out as being a policy nerd. Therefore, I think it's helpful if in all submissions, you stress a point, an important point, often does it go beyond the scope of the enabling legislation, et cetera. Um, I think that's key. I would say that's key for all policy, uh, policy communication in this town. Um, although I recognize that most of, well, not most, but a lot of it is rambling. It is difficult to understand what the point is. So stick to the point, provide evidence. And if 20,000 people are deeply interested in an issue, they should uh, write in. I, what I can tell you on, a, on an issue which I have a, I have a personal interest, um, not a professional interest, I, I made a submission to a, one of the public consultations um, um, to get a very sort of a phone call from a friend going, you know, the director in charge of the file read your uh, submission, um, found it very useful. So if you have a, um, you know, an important point backed up by evidence, you should make it. Um, but just don't sort of gripe and say it's just not fair. That's, that's no use. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Aaron. And thank you very much, of course, Sabina as well. And thank you for attending um, this week's, this week's um, EU Public Affairs Insider Series seminar. Um, it's always a pleasure to have so many of you join us and also for the questions which um, were very, very interesting and, and offer us an opportunity for a discussion at the end of the, the webinar. I was going to hand over to, to John Harper to, to close off, um, who's still with us. So John, do you have any, any final words for our audience? Just trying to unmute John. Um, as we all know, we're all now used to online meetings, but the mute button seems to evade us every time we try and urgently get online. Um, it's sort of the new, the new, the new um, most common. I think the most common used phrase in 2020 was, "Can you hear me?" John, over to you. Um, I'll might be having some technical difficulties. So in, I will, on behalf of John and John Harper Publishing, I will thank everyone for, for attending. The video for this webinar will be on our website within the next couple of days. Do keep an eye out for it. Um, we're going to be having some more Insider Series um, over the next couple of weeks and months. So please do keep an eye out for an email from us and do encourage your friends and colleagues uh, to pop onto our website and register so we can keep them updated. And if you haven't done so already, highly recommend you to purchase the two books, the purple and the orange book. Uh, they are available across booksellers uh, in, in Brussels and we'll have much more information about what's been in today's webinar 
um, and is certainly a very useful reading on how the EU institution works and how to work with the EU institutions. With that in mind, thank you very much for attending. I hope you all have a lovely rest of the day and rest of the week, and please do keep safe. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.